Jammu and Kashmir dispute is the unfinished agenda of the partition of the subcontinent. The rights and aspirations of the Kashmiri people were trampled upon by machinations and intrigue. Territory of Azad, Jammu and Kashmir, where we congregate today, was liberated at the cost of enormous sweat and blood. We have not forgotten the massacre of Muslims in Jammu region in 1947. They were, the, they were among the first martyrs of your movement. History cannot be changed. Ironically today, as India deviously tries to convince the world that Jammu and Kashmir is but an undisputed part of her territory, but history remembers that it was India that took the Jammu and Kashmir, the Jammu and Kashmir dispute to the Security Council as a dispute yet to be resolved. There, the disputed status of Jammu and Kashmir was internationally recognized, and it was decided that the final disposition of the state shall be made through a free and impartial plebiscite under the UN auspices. For more than seven decades now, the Kashmiri people have been denied their inalienable right. I ask the world if a country can be allowed to renege on its solemn commitments to the United Nations, break its own promises, and blatantly violate international law just because they want to. I must emphasize here that the commitments under the UN Security Council resolution are sacrosanct. They are neither servile to the whims of a jingoistic political party, nor diluted by the passage of time. India's continued denial of the rights of the Kashmiri people is wrongful, illegal act. No amount of diplomatic duplicity or Indian state-perpetrated terror can change this fact. India will have to fulfill its obligations to the Security Council by granting the Kashmiri people their lawful right to self-determination. An occupied Kashmir has become an open prison, a prison where Kashmiri Muslims are forced to breathe fear. Thousands of them killed, disappeared, or blinded. Their lands grabbed, their properties confiscated or bulldozed, their culture disintegrated, their media muzzled, the occupying Indian forces run rampant with arbitrary detentions, torture, extrajudicial killings of Kashmiri Muslims. This mayhem continues under draconian laws allowing complete impunity for the Indian occupying forces. This wretched, perpetual and systemic Indian barbarism not just violates international law, it makes a mockery of the accepted norms of fundamental human rights. I ask those who champion the rules-based international order and place a premium on protecting and promoting human rights, how can they turn, an, turn a blind eye to this savagery? It is indeed not wise to sacrifice these timeless principles for short-term interests. One cannot wax lyrical about international law and the United Nations Security Council Council resolutions in Europe, in the European context, and then turn a blind eye to the violation of the same international law in the Kashmiri context. India's unilateral and illegal actions of August 5th, 2019 opened a new chapter of oppression. India's ultimate aim is to convert Kashmiris into a dispossessed and disempowered minority in their own land. The fresh delimitations, domicile certificates to millions of outsiders, and addition of millions of temporary residents to the voters' lists are part of a well-thought-out strategy to change Kashmir's demography and its political landscape. Pakistan outrightly rejects these unilateral and illegal steps. How can the world... How can the world be a silent bystander when a large country usurps the rights guaranteed by the Security Council and instead use brute force to suppress those rights? Isn't it the same world that is upholding these principles elsewhere while remaining completely oblivious to them in Kashmir? 
Mr. Speaker, as we speak, India is hosting the meeting of, the, of a tourism working group in Sirinagar. Meetings of a consultative forum on youth affairs, Y20, has already been held in Jammu, Leh and Sirinagar in the past few weeks. This is yet another display of India's arrogance on the world stage. Indian occupation of a territory that is recognized as disputed under international law. India is misusing its position as chair of the G20, a forum created to address global financial and economic issues with utter disregard for the Security Council resolution, the UN Charter and its principle. India's facade of normalcy in Kashmir is met by the harsh reality that occupied Kashmir remains one of the most militarized zones on the planet. I remind the world that there are two reports on the situation in occupied Kashmir by the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, issued in 2018 and 2019. Those of us who are interested in upholding human rights are morally bound to pay attention to these reports. The word Pakistan is incomplete without Kashmir. The people of Pakistan and the people of Kashmir have a unique affinity based on geographical proximity, shared history, commonality of religion. We have shared joys, shared sorrows, we share the same hopes, the same, the same dreams, our hearts beat as one. Pakistan cannot ignore what happens in Jammu and Kashmir. It is a party to the dispute. For us, it is not a matter of choice. We are duty bound to play our role in the just and peaceful resolution of the Jammu and Kashmir dispute in accordance with the UN Security Council resolutions and the wishes of the people of Kashmir. Mr. Speaker, my presence here today is a testimony of our nation's international, intergen not international, intergenerational support and lasting commitment to the Kashmir cause. We want good relations with our neighbors, including India. However, good relations can only be achieved through dispute resolution and not through dispute denialism. Durable peace in South Asia remains contingent upon the settlement of the Jammu and Kashmir dispute. Despite our consistent advocacy for constructive engagement and result oriented dialogue to resolve all outstanding issues, including the core issue of Jammu and Kashmir, India unabatedly remains hostile. Its regressive actions have in fact further vitiated the environment and the onus therefore remains on India to take the necessary steps to create an enabling environment conducive for a meaningful and result oriented dialogue. During my recent visit to Goa to attend the security, uh, the SCO meeting, I repeatedly said that India would have to revert to the situation on the 4th of August 2019 to work out a way forward.